Hi, everyone. What's up? Wow. Um, this is a nice turnout. We were just saying backstage that this feels different from every other part of South by you've experienced so far. Yeah, I've been like, you know, covered in beer and barbecue <laughs> sauce. And then we walked in and it's like really soft music and carpeting. And I was like, well, this is different. I will, be li I will say you clean up very nicely, though. A lot <laughs> The, la the last time I saw you at about 11 o'clock last night, you were, you know, you'd become a canvas. Um, and and um, this actually, you could have used this. I could have, right? yeah. Right? The tailored plastic. <laughs> um, what, a f what an amazing show, and one that was, I mean, I was saying backstage, different for you. I, it was like, I've never seen you sort of, uh, sort of as raw and just kind of, you know, anything goes. It, it, um, th obviously, there's something you did, you created just for South by, right? And with a specific idea behind it. Yeah, you know, we really wanted to do something that was in the spirit of what uh, South by Southwest has always been about, which is creating a real connection between the fans and the artists and the musical experience. So I actually spent the first four days that I was here just going out to see music and experiencing the atmosphere. And I really built the set around uh, Austin. I really wanted it to just give as much as I could to the city. It's amazing. Did you, you guys like the mechanical swine? I thought that was a nice touch. And the neon thing was super cool too. And obviously, what's going to end up with that? It's like the, it was just for that show, right? The neon sign with the, the neon lights. The, the sign with the with the pig and the house. The swine, swine. sign. Yeah, yeah. Well, my father has requested that he wants it. He does. Yeah. Nice touch. Yeah. So to the house. Papa yeah. G gets first dibs. <laughs> um, I, I want to ask you a few things about the show, but I, the thing that you know, if you just the minute I went online this morning, last night too, but certainly this morning. I'm sure most of you saw in your feeds too. It just one word: vomit, 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 vomit. So, that, I mean, let's talk about Millie. You, we, we'd actually spoken a couple nights ago before the show, and uh, so I knew that she was going to be a part of the show. This is someone you've known for a while, right? Yeah, I've known Millie for I think like maybe five years now, and we've actually collaborated before. We did a film together, a similar collaboration for the Monster Ball. We made a film with Nick Knight, and that's the first time I met her. And we were on our way to Austin. I was actually getting on the airplane, and my girlfriend, uh, Nicole, texted me, and she said, oh, did you know Millie Brown's going to be in town? And I said, oh, I had no idea. And then I texted Millie, and I said, oh, we should, we should get together. And, uh, you know, she was just in town, so we thought we'd collaborate. Um, what did you think of the reaction? Have you seen some of the reaction to it online and, and elsewhere? I mean, it's, it's, it's interesting. It, it's everything from, oh, I'm, how, how could she do this kind of thing, putting the gag in Gaga kind of headlines. But, um, <laughs> but, but, but also, as you were saying to me a little earlier, um, a lot of people seem to sort of get that this is, that this is in fact, her, her art. This is her. Yeah, well, you know, it's, it was just exciting to see people talking about performance art on the internet and you know debating about whether it's art or not and that's really um it's really great i mean we we really just did it because um we believe in the performance and we believe in what it meant to the song uh and she was in town so we wanted to work together mm -hmm. uh so i guess the, the the way i like to think of things is is I am so deeply passionate about any person that has an artistic spirit. Mm -hmm. Any person that has a talent that they believe in, no matter how crazy the idea is, you never know where that crazy idea might lead you. You know, uh, Martin Luther King thought, you know, he could start a revolution without violence. And Andy Warhol thought that he could uh, make a soup can into art. Mm -hmm. And sometimes things that are really, really strange and feel really wrong can really change the world. I'm not saying vomit's going to change the world. <laughs> but what I'm saying is this is the idea of a moment where 
it's truly just what we wanted to create and do. And us just respecting each other as artists was enough for the performance to be worth it. Art pop. The, also, the show also was uh, primarily art pop. I think that um, I think that Bad Romance was Bad Romance the only non art pop, art pop track last night. Or yes, yes, it was. Um, and when you did applause, even you said we kind of felt we like we were we were told we needed to we should do applause. I'm I'm misquoting you, but right, you weren't really that into doing applause last night. Well, no, we were sort of joking as well. I mean, I I did want to do applause, but um, more so just sort of the idea that uh, I really wanted to create a show that was really perfect for Austin, mm -hmm. and uh, we thought that it would be good to close with applause, but. Uh, I really wanted to close with Gypsy, so I was really just making a crack so that my team would start laughing. No, I mean, Gypsy could not have been a better choice, because there, there was also an inspirational tone to the show, and a lot of the, the things you said were, I was straight up, I, I mean, every time you would, uh, a couple times you mentioned uh, Twitter, the, the, the albatross that is Twitter. Um, I was like, yes, you know, ha happy that you said that. But, um, but no, uh, Gypsy is, it's just got an inspirational quality that, I, and I, I hope the song, as time goes on, actually gets more attention. I know that when the record first came out, you did a few performances, um, you did a Vivo thing, and so obviously those, most of the tracks had been heard as the album came out already, but um, I, I hopefully there will be a video for, for Gypsy at some point. Yeah, <clears throat> at some point. Right? <laughs> that would be great. There is, however, another video on the way, right? Yeah, I have a video. I'm actually put, putting it out Saturday. A week, this a week Next from, Saturday, yeah, yeah. A week from tomorrow? Yeah. Anything we can say about it? What it, it's the, the idea behind it? Or? Well, I, no. No? <laughs> okay. Uh, but we shot it at Hearst Castle. Nice. And uh, it's a different type of uh, video for me. And you know, in a different way from what we did at, at South By last night, but still in the same spirit. Uh, there is a very uh, deeply creative, rebellious spirit in art pop, and you know, kind of wrapping what we were talking about with Millie and the Swine performance yesterday, and uh, the video that's coming up. You know, really what it's about is freeing yourself of the expectations of the music industry mm -hmm. and the expectations of the status quo. I never really liked having my shirt, my skirt measured for me in school mm -hmm. or told how to do things or um, the rules to play by. And you know, as you become more and more successful, they start to push the rule book closer and closer to you and say, well, you know, now you're here, so how are you going to maintain it? And really what Art Pop is all about is how the truest way for us to maintain the music industry is to put all of the power back into the hands of the artist. And when, and when people inevitably get into the horse race, the chart race, the, 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 the sort of the sound scan horse race, um, is it just, what's your reaction to it? Do you just try to not pay attention to the, the numbers game as, as much as possible? Well, it's like completely mental, right? You have this um, completely passionate experience with music or with whatever you're creating, whether it's a film or a television series, maybe you write poetry or you put on a play. I make music and the second I put it out into the world, it gets like eaten by a computer and it starts running through all these numbers and mm. systems and ranking and it's, you know, it's, it's terrifying. But I think what we have to remember is that the way that we talk about that process is really what the problem is. Placing the importance on those charts, placing the importance on that system. What happens is, is you start trying to influence the artist or influence the artists in the industry to approach their work or approach channeling their artists towards being successful within that system. Now, 
When you do that, you take the power out of the hands of the artist and you put it in the hands of the corporation. And that means that you have less of a chance, you at home with your guitar, you have less of a chance of making it happen on your own because you need for somebody in a corporate tower somewhere to tell you, oh, no, 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 this is how you do it. This is how you're gonna make it on the top of the charts. This is how you're gonna make it on the radio. But I don't want that to be who's dictating what music I'm listening to. I don't think any of us want that to be what's dictating what we're listening to. You know, um, I said to her the other night, I was, I was, um, I, I said, you know, obviously I'm, this is going to be a packed room on Friday when we talk, and I'm sure there will be a lot of fans. I'm guessing I see a fan right there. Um, uh, and, and I said, but it being, this being South by, I said, God, I'm sure there'll be a, a, you know, a few skeptics in the room. And she was like, a few? <laughs> I, ex I, I expect they're all gonna hate me. And I said, oh, come on now. But, but obviously that's not the case. But um, there is a, and it's not, this is nothing new. This is a story, a story that's been sort of hounding South by for five to 10 years now. This an increasing tendency of superstars to swoop in here to Austin for 48 hours, and you know whether it's Samsung or T-Mobile or a chip company uh, footing the footing the bill, um, you know uh, there obviously there's there's snipe there's griping about that and 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 I you know what are your and initially there was there was some comment when the f word first came out that you were going to be here with with Doritos and then the, and and then I know that the majority of the proceeds are going to go to the foundation, right? Yes. Yeah. Well, yes. They, they made a, quite an amazing donation to the Born This Way Foundation Doritos, and we're actually extremely grateful. But, you know, to be completely honest, whoever is writing or saying all of those things, you don't know fuck about the state of the music industry. Yeah. And, you know, I think it's also about how the artist chooses to engage in these sorts of relationships, you know? What's the type of relationship? What's the philosophy behind the collaboration? Do you have things in common? Do you not? When you come to do the performance, how much time do you put into it? Do you really care about the show? Or are you just taking the check and showing up? Are you only coming to Austin for the press? Or do you want to have a real connection with the fans? I mean, the best thing that happened last night is I came off the stage. I was covered in, in paint, vomit, the, we did live art during this show and the CEO of Frito-Lay came in with all her kids and was like, that was so brilliant, and she was crying. <laughs> there you go. And I'm standing there, I'm like, oh, thank you. <laughs> you know, and my publicist walks in, I'm like, did you quit in the middle of the show? And he's like, no, it was amazing. And you know, it's because that, you know, sensationalized headlines they, you know, if we, I listen to the internet very closely. I work with Salesforce, I work with Lair. My team and I have our ear to the ground all the time about how people are talking about what we're creating, how the information is getting out to the public, what the messaging is. And, you know, watching, watching the fans have an experience with um, me and then having Doritos support that to its core, not telling me how to do the show, what should be like, or putting chains around my neck. They just said, we just want to support you and having a great experience at South by we want to help your foundation, and we want to help spread the message, how do we do that? And they came up with bold bravery, and it all came together. And, and I, um, I think that what is the most important thing is that we remember that all of these things that people are saying, it's just to inspire clicks to their websites, mm. more visits, yeah. right? And, uh, they want to be the first person to say the thing that everybody reads, right? But the truth is that without sponsorships, without 
these companies coming together to help us. We won't have any more artists in Austin. We won't have any festivals because record labels don't have any fucking money. In fact, in fact, you were telling me the other night that even you are having to, there's things that you want to do event-wise, the Art Pop um, launch event in, in, uh, in Brooklyn, that, which was essentially you on the I funding. paid for the whole thing. Yeah. Because, yeah. you know, I just, at the end of the day, I said this last night on stage, it's like, nobody's going to remember what you tweeted when you die. Nobody's going to remember your web content for the week. What's going to be remembered is those magical moments that you have helped to create, bringing artists and the artistic community together to breed the compassion and the love that comes with creating. And that's why I, you know, I've been talking so much about creative rebellion because it's like, what are we? What are we as an industry if we are not telling our artists to be creative? What are we? What are we doing? What's happening? Why? Why is it a prison? And why are we allowing it to be a prison? Every person in here should take pride in swining their nose up at anyone that would say, ugh, Doritos, Lady Gaga. Samsung, Jay-Z. Why shouldn't someone in Austin have the chance to see Jay-Z up close and personal? Why? As long, I, I, I completely agree, as long as they're out there seeing those, those emerging artists who deserve to be seen as yes, well. Yes, and what you know? we can do, what we can do is as a group and as a unit, you know, I brought my friends from New York who are young bands still. They're not that young. They've been doing it for like 15 years. But I... You know, we're all young bands. I brought them with me. They opened the show for me. I brought them on stage with me during applause. All the artists that come here and all the corporations that come here, you can still make an effort to integrate new emerging acts and talent into your shows. So you can bring the two things together. Use the, the acts that are bigger to shine the light on the new ones and bring people together, art pop. Absolutely. Um, so there's a, there's, there's a few things I want to talk to you about, um, but in terms of just sort of real, like, immediately upcoming things, um, this show was, this was quite specific to, to Austin and to South By. You've got a string of shows coming up for all of us New Yorkers, something very special at the iconic Roseland Ballroom, a place I've seen many, many amazing shows, and sadly uh, is closing down very soon. Um, how did that come about, you playing the last shows at Roseland, and sort of what does, that, what does that mean to you? My gosh, it means everything to me. I mean, I'm so excited, and it's, it, it, you know, I started out playing in small clubs and bars. I mean, Roseland's not that small, actually, in comparison to where I started playing out. My first show was at the Bitter End in New York when I was 15. A lot smaller than Stubbs. A lot smaller than <laughs> Stubbs, yeah. Um, you know, it's, it's a wonderful experience, and it was Arthur Fogel. Arthur Fogel called me, and he said, you know, Roseland is closing. We want you to, you know, close it out. What do you think about that? I said, this is great. And he said, do you want to do this many shows or this many shows? And he said, or you could do eight shows in a row and be the, the most shows anyone's ever done at Roseland. And I said, okay, let's do it, whatever. Sounds good. Let's go for it. I bet you can't reveal too much about the shows, but I, I understand there's going to be some New York-themed aspects to the, to, to the show. E yes. Yeah. Well, I'm from New York. Right. <laughs> Number one. <laughs> I'm pretty New York-themed <laughs> to my core. Yeah. So, you know, the, the show, I, look, I always tell people, you know, we rehearse, we rehearse over and over, we put a show together, and then, you know, we press play and the lights come up and I can't promise anything. I don't know what's going to happen. It's <laughs> like I just go into a total trance and as long as I'm in that place, you know, I know it will be great. All right. Um, do you have any memories of Roseland yourself? Shows you've seen there or times you've spent there? 
I mean, I spent a lot of time yeah. there. Uh, I don't know if I can remember. <laughs> it's such a, <laughs> it, it's such an interesting place because it's. I mean, I, I, I remember seeing everyone from you know, um, Radiohead or uh, My Bloody Valentine there to all the way to Madonna doing a, a early. Uh, I think it was. Uh, the music album, maybe? I can't remember. She did sort of a pre-album. So I mean, it's, it's been a venue in recent years for s sort of major stars to do smaller shows pre-album release or along with album release. It's just so not how I see Roseland. I, I view it as like uh, the place my mom didn't want me to go to. Yeah. You know, because I'd come home with a broken nose, or you know, like I was, I was that kid. I used to sneak out and go to shows, and I mean, I, I think that um, it's a really true New York classic, yeah. that place, and it's so sad to see it go. And uh, I think that, you know, in the spirit of Roseland, we need to keep, you know, pushing forward in this business, keeping the classics around for as long as we can, you know. We're losing a wonderful place and a wonderful venue, but the spirit of that venue, I hope, lives on in New York, and I hope that uh, you know bands continue to play and and flourish. And uh, I'm just really excited. I feel really honored as a New Yorker to be closing it out. I mean, yeah. that's that's really how I feel. I just want to I want to do it justice and leave my heart in, on the stage. Are you in general a nostalgic? I mean, you know, we, I, there's a lot of hand wringing in New York about the fact that. Seabees is no more, the old knitting factory is no more, Maxwell's just closed, Roseland's going away. Uh, or do you feel like, you know, there's the other attitude is that, you know, we're a city, and I, I hate to be all New York-y on you guys, but just for a moment, um, that we're a city that's constantly regenerating and that we're, you know, we will create new spaces and new places that, 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 that make their own memories. Well, I played all those venues you just mentioned. Mm -hmm. I played CBGB's, mm -hmm. I played Max's, I played the Knitting Factory, both the big one and yeah, the little and one. The, and the one. Yeah. <laughs> and I think it's really sad, mm -hmm. actually. I'm not too excited about, you know, New. remodeling. Mm -hmm. I think that there's something nice about the heart and soul and the heartbeat of generations of music going away. I mean, so many bands, so much musical history. And I think that we all, everyone in this room, needs to do everything that we can as, as a unit to continue to inspire passion in young people so that they don't feel that the only way to success now is by making a crazy YouTube video or doing something psycho on Instagram. You know, the way to make it in this business is to write songs and to go out into the world, pick up your guitar, and walk from block to block and say, hi, I'm Lady Gaga, I'm an artist. Can you book me at seven o'clock on Friday? Mm -hmm. Or 10 if and you're you know really what? lucky. That's, and that's your reality. I mean, you did that. You pounded the pavement and, and, you know, for years down in the LES, um, and that's part of your story, but for some reason I feel like the skeptics, and there are some, will still are like, was she ever really, was there ever really a struggle? You know, you know what I mean? it's like, it doesn't really matter what people say because the truth is always what will carry me through into the next phase of my life. Um, Nobody fucking knows how many clubs I played right. and how much piss I stepped in, <laughs> how many bathrooms I changed in, how many times I carried my keyboard down the stairs with my walk up on my back. You know, what matters is that I know. And that's why I'm still here. I'm still here because I would rather go back to Stanton Street and perform alone in a bar than do something I don't want to do and be an artist that I'm not and be rich and famous. I will be unhappy. Um, the one other point I wanted to make about the uh, upcoming... I'm sorry, I just have one more thing to say too. What's that? I just wanted to say okay. also that, you know, for young people that want to make music, I feel like the scariest thing that I experience 
is when I'm, you know, I go to sometimes these, you know, corporate events or I meet people and they introduce me to their artists, you know, whatever. They bring me these young kids and they're like, I'm working with this producer and that producer and I'm friends with, you know, Lil John or whatever, you know, just name dropping and and I'm I'm just sitting there like wanting to grab and shake them and go like go to a city and sit in an apartment by yourself and stop shaking hands with people and taking selfies because it's not going to make you a star. Nobody cares about that. We think that everybody cares about it because, you know, it's the way that culture is now it's so fast and you get messages and like so quickly somebody can become so big. But what makes a sustainable career somebody that has the true heart and ability to feel the pain of this business for a long period of time because you're willing to suffer and do anything for music because you love it, you have to. You believe in it to your core. Songs are the Justin Tranter from Semi Precious last night. He looked at me, we were laying in the Airstream backstage at Stubbs. Mm. He looks at me and he says, oh Gaga, songs are the coolest thing in the world. <laughs> and I was like, I know, I love songs. You know, there's nothing like writing songs, really. And we were just talking about songs. And that's who you should be signing. That's who you should be promoting, is people that write songs, songwriters, people that need to have to. Not somebody that has, you know, a bunch of followers on Twitter. Or, you know, it's like the only reason that it mattered how many followers I had on Twitter was because I have a real relationship with my fans, a real true one, a real genuine friendship. I really understand them and I know they understand me. I just wanted to say that, you know, it's like, be careful what type of business you're selling. Because if you're selling anything other than talent and anything other than good songs, you're in the wrong business. The, absolutely. The one, the one other thing I wanted to, uh, observation I wanted to make about those Roseland dates is that the first date, March 28th, some of you may know, this woman turns 28, so. Um, which means, on a happy note, that you have survived being a member of the 27 Club. That's true. Not yet, I still have a couple uh, weeks. Yeah, it's true. <laughs> Two weeks, two weeks. Um, but uh, not that you were ever in danger of becoming a member of it, but I mean. <laughs> but, I don't know, you should go talk to my mom. Uh, okay. <laughs> but I mean, uh, to be fair, um, 2013 wasn't probably the best year in some respects, no. right? Um, at the beginning of the year, you wrote um, a message, a, there was a post on little, littlemonsters.com that was, and we talked about this the other night, um, full of almost like just uh, re regret about the fact that you felt maybe you had either let fans down or perhaps even in some respects let yourself down last year. Yeah. I know there was a lot going on between the hit, I mean, a year, a year ago right now, you were laid up. You had been just, a, it was only a couple weeks, it was February that yeah. the Montreal show happened and everything went to, to shit, right? Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, I, yeah, I was in a wheelchair for like four months. With what at first you didn't even know was a broken hip. No, I just, you know, I love my fans and adrenaline will take you very far and I just, I danced until I couldn't walk anymore and I actually, uh, my hip was actually falling apart, my right, my right hip, so there's three screws in it now. But I'm back and everything's okay. <laughs> Who'd have thought that someone with three screws in her hip could sling around a mechanical swine and come out on a, on a spit? And it looks like you're not compromised in terms of what you can do physically anymore. No, I don't, yeah, actually that's a good word, compromise. Yeah. You know, that is, I think, why I posted that message. I, you know, I, I grew up loving music, and you watch your favorite artists grow, and 
You know, it's an age-old tale, right? They build you up to, to tear you down. And you watch it happen and you see so many artists try so hard to act like it's not affecting them or I'm okay and putting on a front and just keep going. And, you know, people in your life change and money makes everything so complicated and success and people betray you and it's... I just sort of decided that, you know, I owe it to my work to just be an open book and fuck, like I became really famous and I used to play in bars and when, when it becomes complicated like that, you sort of ask yourself like, do I even want to make music anymore on a commercial level? I'll just go make music downtown. I'll still be happy. I will. I don't, I don't need all of that if it means, if it means negativity, if it means compassion, if it means, you know, people in business grabbing at you and trying to define you. You know, you have to understand that when everyone's waiting for me to put music out, right, or a record album, you know, the label or management, there's no formula ever behind what we've done. And there's no uh, process, like a, something that was created, like I'm not from a factory, right? So they're essentially waiting for a completely crazy person <laughs> to deliver something they've never heard. They don't know anything about it. And I'm going to say, from nothing, mm -hmm. blank. It's like a water glass, nothing. And then I, they're waiting for me to just give them all the music, give them the message, give them the visuals, everything behind it. And it can be very terrifying for people because they have now, you know, a tour to sell, and they have uh, singles that they need to keep up with, and they have a quota for the end of the year. And, you know, I don't know what to tell you. I didn't read a special book mm -hmm. to teach me how to do this, and nobody put me into a weird machine and popped me out gaga. It's really truly who I am. So it's kind of like you just have to fight everybody off and, and say, Listen, you're just gonna have to chill out. It's just pop music, it's not brain surgery. <laughs> and you know, what I was saying in that is that I, re I refuse to compromise and allow my talents to be monetized to the point that I don't even wanna be here anymore. I, won't, I will stop. I will stop, I will quit. I will retire from the commercial market if I have to do something other than be myself. Because if I can't be myself, in this moment, then everything I have said to my fans since the beginning would be a total lie. Because then what? I'm, I'll be myself until I have to make money to sustain a luxurious lifestyle? Oh, and then I'll change, right? No. I'll be myself until I fucking close the coffin so that you can all be yourselves. One of my friends... Um, after watching the, the, the show on, on Fuse last night, one of my friends texted me and said, I'm not sure she wants to be a pop star anymore. And I said, I said and I wrote him back and I was like, well, if what you mean by pop star is what passes for the things you've got to sort of, the hoops you've got to jump through to be a pop star in 2014 for a lot of people, I hope you're right that she doesn't want to be a pop star anymore because I think that, the, and, and I've long felt that what you, you know, what you, uh, what you represent is, is something that, to even talk about you in the same conversation sometimes as some, some other folks, it's, it's just sort of, to me, it's beside the point. But, um, but regarding that, everything kind of, it was an odd time the fall, wasn't it? A lot came to, to a head. I mean, you parted ways with your manager, and we don't have to talk about all the whys and wherefores about that if you don't want. There was a, there was a lawsuit. Um, from a, a friend, a friend and former assistant, and um, and then people were sniping about the record and how it was doing and, and, and doing again, like I said before, that horse race of like, I mean now it's just this. I mean, and I, 
I deal with this every day because we're doing music news every day. But you know, it's it's how did it enter? It was an, was it number one, and how strong a number one, and how did it compare to this superstar? And oh, by the way, let's really pit her against other women because we really like to do the whole you know woman versus woman thing. Because boy, who who doesn't love a pop cat fight? So it was at first it was at first it was roar versus applause when applause came out a bit early. And then it was the album, and how's it going to open? And how? And do you just, at, at some point, do you just say, stop with all that noise? And or is it hard not to get? No, it's I don't. That's well, a long, that was a convoluted question. Things. I'm trying to figure out where to start. We could talk about um, any of those things. You know, I. We've sold over two and a half million copies of our pop all over the world. I'm sorry I didn't sell a million <laughs> records the first week. I have before. I've sold 27 million albums. I, I'm very proud of what we did. I sold you as should, much as everybody else sells. I mean, I, I made a record. Look, I, the more, I, I mean, it's so not, insane. I'm held to such an insane standard. It's like, it's almost like everybody forgets. Which is maybe a compliment to me. When it comes to me, everybody forgets where the music business is now. It's like it's like your time. Like you come see me live, or you listen to my music, and you're time warped to the '70s or something. I don't know. I don't know why. Um, but yeah, I don't know what what fuck all I have to do with Katy Perry. I mean, it's like my music's so completely different. I couldn't be more different, really, and. I really don't fit in pop music in a way, but I came in through it, and I'd like to think, and I hope to think that I've changed it in some way, so that you made it a lot more interesting. So that you all can feel like you don't have to fit into a mold. You know, I didn't have to fit into a mold. They tried. I was actually I saw um, Ski the other night, who. Uh, is a uh, he works for Kiss, you know, mm -hmm. and he's a, amazing. He did my first interview, and he leaned over and he was like, you know, I'll never forget how when you first started, everybody was leaning over you, telling you your show was too gay and that it would never work, mm -hmm. and everybody was tell like it was like a thing in the business that I would walk in and everyone would go, it's too gay, it's never gonna work, right? You know, and I I used to sit in the room with all types of people in the industry. And I would say, okay, so, but I grew up playing in clubs and have a lot of gay friends and I have a lot of gay fans. So, so now you don't want it to be gay, but, but you want me to have them as fans? So you just want me to use people, right? Is that what you're asking me to do? I won't do that. I'd rather just have a real connection with them that have a fake one. You, you see, in the business, they're always trying to open and widen your demographic, right? Oh, well, you have them, right? So why don't you go after them now? So you can have more. <laughs> we need to have more. I don't need more. I have my amazing fans. I love you. I don't need anybody else. If you want to come hang out with us and come to the party, you're all invited, but I don't. I don't need, need, need more, 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 and I certainly wouldn't just abandon my morals and my core values sure. to, um, to what? And to be more famous? And how great is it, <laughs> <laughs> how great is it that in the six years that, or so that you've been in our lives that we've almost, not maybe not quite entirely, but we've almost reached the point where there, where there is no such thing as too gay. <laughs> Right, um, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm actually in a couple hours after we finish this, I'm going to be sitting down with Big Frida and Sharon Needles. You know, yeah. great. And I, I couldn't be more excited. And Laura Jane Grace, who's amazing, so yeah. I, I couldn't be more excited about doing that. So, um, so in terms of um, regarding art pop, there had been talk of. Uh, Part two, and you told me the other day that, that there is um, really virtually completed an act two of the I album. Told, actually, what I told you is that there's many volumes of oh, work okay. over a long period of time that have just not been released to the public because I've chosen not to put it into the system. But you know, because <laughs> you know, sometimes it's just fun to have records 
that me and my friends listen to and we love it. We don't care what anybody else thinks. I don't care. So maybe one day I'll release them. And yeah, I have, I have a whole second active art pop, I do. And I love it. And I love art pop so much. I mean, that album got me through the hardest time. You know, I, making that record was, um, it healed my soul every single night. It's like the most incredible thing when your friend can like play a bass line that just gets inside your spirit and your heart like that and you say, oh, I was feeling so sick but then you played that and now I feel so alive and I feel like I can keep going and then the words start to come and then the poetry and then it becomes a song and then you and everybody in the room together, you have an experience that's then encapsulated into an auditory moment that will last forever. I mean, it's like, that's what the fuck it's all about. Absolutely. Um, I don't I know, know if you've ever felt like, you know, before so alone or like you just can't go on or you don't want to go to work or you're so sad, but it's your creative spirit, you know? It's that thing in you that's rebellious that you can just like keep going because you know that no matter who leaves you in your life, that your talent will never leave you. It will never leave you. So love your passion. Love it harder than anything else. And, you know, pack your bags and chase the sunset. Yes. Love that. Love, <laughs> whoa. I love that line. Love that yeah, line. You're just so making me. Exactly. Exactly. Um, I would, I would love to spend another hour here, but I'm told that we we are um, up against it at 12:30. Something else is in here, so I need to get to the fan questions that were um, Great. were sent to you. And so I am gonna read them to you. You know what? Look, this is what you have to look forward to when you get old. I'm 28. I'm old like for pop stars. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, our fir the first question comes from Emilio Esteban, as opposed to Esteban, I think Esteban. Dear Lady Mother of All Monsters, what vibe, energy, or presence could you say that Austin has compared to any other city you have visited, and is there any comparison to New York City? It's a great vibe here. I mean, I had the best time this week. I mean, so much love between everyone. So much respect. I didn't see anybody fighting. I didn't see anyone acting hateful or negative. I saw so much positivity and love for music. I saw true, genuine music lovers. And, you know, I think that the most beautiful thing I saw was uh, the artists, the new artists playing and watching them react to their new fans, watching them react as people came through the door to hear their music. and. You'd see their faces light up, or you'd see them get nervous, or you'd see them start performing <laughs> a little harder, and oh, it made me so happy. You know, it was, I'd say that um, the vibe actually reminded me a lot of the bars that I used to hang out in all the sure. time with Starlight and Semi Precious Weapons and the Dirty Pearls. You know, we were, they came with me last night, and they were all like saying that it was the best party they'd been to in the longest mm -hmm. time, and I think it's because. You know, I think all music lovers are connected. And anytime you put music lovers in a room with beer and a <laughs> shitty sound system, everybody that gets helps. excited. Um, this next one, I'm, you, you always strike me as a no regrets kind of person, so I'm not sure how you'll feel about this, but it says, looking, this is from Stephen in New York City, looking back on your path to success, what, if anything, would you do differently if you had a second chance? If I had a second chance. You know, I really wouldn't do anything differently. I really wouldn't. I, I, I'm so, I'm, I'm, I, I can't believe every day I wake up, I pinch myself. I can't believe I get to make music and travel the world and, and that I have so many people who love it. Thank you. Thank you. And that's, that's really it. You know, um, I, I'm very hard on myself. 
But I don't think that's bad. No. I think all artists are. I think we all are very critical and kind of innately damaged. And that's why we make things to fix ourselves. We were saying the other night, you, I, one thing you and I share is that we both have a tendency to be a little self-deprecating. Yeah, self-deprecating humor. And <laughs> I always tell people when they, they're so like, why, you, why, do you, why are you down on yourself too much? And I said, because I prefer that to the alternative. And there's way too much of the alternative out there nowadays, right? Yeah. So um, this one completely relates to that moment when applause happened last night with all, with Starlight and all the others from New York. And um, so the question is, what was the saddest part about rising up and away from that club scene of New York City? And what is the happiest part about it? Well, I'll start with the happiest. The happiest part about it is that they're all still here with me. Mm -hmm. And you know, nothing is more amazing than getting to see the world and bringing all your friends with you. All your friends that you got changed with in the bathroom stalls before you... I used to open for Semi Precious Weapons before their show. I remember sitting on my bed on Stanton Street and my, my apartment was like the size of this stage. And I got a phone call that they wanted me to open for them and I started screaming and I called Lady Starlight and I told her to come over and we set up turntables in my kitchen. <laughs> Wow. And, you know, the best thing about it is, you know, whether we're at South by on stage together looking out at the crowd or when we were in Mexico City, I brought them all out on stage with me there and we're standing in front of 80,000 people singing every word to Born This Way and we're just looking at each other and, and going, oh my gosh, every crazy idea that we ever had. Look where we are, look where it took us. You know, we didn't have to change who we were. I didn't let anybody change me. I never let anybody tell me what to do. And as soon as I did, I'll say the saddest, right? The hardest thing about it is it's so hard to say no when you see how many people's lives are affected by the business that we're doing and you see people making money and you see their businesses growing and then they start to really depend on you to keep that money flow happening and they really want you to I don't know maybe they want me to be more perfect or brush my hair or uh, you know not do anything that's too crazy, or they just want me to come, you know, oh, you, we have it now, you know, you don't have to do anything. And this, so the sad part is that at some point you have to look at those people that, you know, believe in you and say, you know, my talent matters more to me than the money does. Mm -hmm. and, and what I have to say matters more to me than the money does. And I know that it's fun being on top and I know it's fun having everybody wish that, you know, they were number one. But having people envy you really isn't fun at all. Having people feel a part of you and feel one with you, that's the greatest feeling that there is. You told me a story the other night similar to that about when you came home from the, uh, from the art ray from the launch party in Brooklyn. And didn't you say there were like kids sort of outside your place and they had been there and they said they'd never experienced a night quite like that. And yeah. I just, I, I could tell that was a real moment that stuck with you. Yeah, they were, there was like a hundred, two hundred, um, hundreds <laughs> of kids covered in baby Kuntz sculptures <laughs> and beautiful outfits and they had taken their wigs off and their masks and they'd all had too much to drink. And they were all standing on the footsteps of my, of my apartment and they, they stopped screaming and they stopped pulling and asking for pictures and they just all looked at me and they said, 
Gaga, I've never had so much fun in my whole life. And that's the coolest I've ever felt in my whole life. And, you know, that's really all that I ever could ask for is to make somebody feel that way. Make someone feel the way that I felt the first time I walked into a bar and saw Lady Starlight doing her performance art. The first time I walked into a club at pianos and saw Semi Precious Weapons playing. Or the first time that my ex boyfriend took me to see the Dirty Pearls and I took my bra off and ran on stage. <laughs> it's like those moments in music, that's what it's all about, is that experience. It's not about the picture you got for your Twitter, it's about that thing that changed your life, that made you want to be a star, that made you want to go for it. And that's the sad thing, is when you, mi you miss it, you want to go back. Sure. But I don't have to miss it, because they're all here with me. And I can go back whenever I want, because I would give it up all tomorrow if it meant I had to sell my soul to this business. Don't do it. Don't sell out to this business. S sell in. Cool. Sell in. Um, whoever, the South by folks listening to this, I can't see the clock from where I'm sitting, so <laughs> I'm depending on someone to give me a rap song. We're a deeply professional duo, <laughs> me and John. We are, yeah. Um, I'm, I'll never be a real professional. I think. <laughs> me anyway, neither, it's um, So the next one, I'm just going to keep going for a couple more of these. Um, what is the one thing that you were told to be or do as a little girl that if you had listened to it, you would not be where you are today. Any bad advice or? Well, how little are we talking? <laughs> <laughs> when I was really, really little, um, my parents actually were very amused by my eccentricities, I guess. And they, you, my mom used to yell at me if I took all my clothes off and ran around from the baby and babysitter, but, you know, everybody does that, right? <laughs> I will say that around, like, 15 years old, because I've been playing piano since I was four years old, and I started writing music around 11, and then 15, my dad and I went to Manny's Music in New York, and I got a Tascam tape deck, and a Shure microphone, and I learned how to record myself, which is pretty rare for a female. And you can imagine me hanging out with a bunch of dudes, right, going, oh, should we record it? And they're like, what do you know about recording? <laughs> and then I started taking out compressors and impressing everybody. <laughs> um, oh, um, uh, what what, what they advice? told me was to be less uh -huh. theatrical. Yeah? Yeah. Wow. We think you're too theater. <laughs> <laughs> and I would say, but, th but Freddie Mercury was theater, and David Bowie sure. was theater, and, you know, Sgt. Pepper, even though people didn't like it when it first came out, at one point later, it was everybody's favorite Beatles album, even though mine is Abbey Road. And you know, I never thought theater was a bad thing, but in the music business when I first started, like younger, younger, when people start seeing me play out, they, everyone started hearing about me, even when I was really wee thing. And they would say, you know, she's too theatrical. So if I had listened to them, I definitely wouldn't be here today because I would be sad and depressed and I would be an awful person if I didn't do what I love. Because doesn't everyone feel that way when you stifle yourself? You're miserable. Don't do it. Don't do it. Okay, I'm going to get to one more, and then I got one more for myself, then we're going to wrap things up. Um, Lisa B., and we kind of touched on this already uh, a little bit, wants to know that throughout your journey, what was the greatest challenge maintaining individuality and uniqueness in an industry that so often requires artists to conform? That was the challenge. That yeah, is the, the great, challenge. That is the challenge. <laughs> that yeah. is the challenge. That is the challenge. Is you know, once you, once you have 
you know, so many people's attention and once you have so much, they just, they think that, you know, as a female, that it's better for me to make inconsequential music and not assert that I'm a musician, not assert that I'm a producer, not assert that I'm a songwriter, not assert that I'm a performance artist and just look beautiful. I think that that's been the, that's the thing that poisoned me from 2013 to 2014 or 2012. But that was, that was the poisonous thing. We just want you to look beautiful over and over and over in my head until I just wanted to look ugly all the time because I'm rebellious. Because when you get pushed back, you want to do the opposite. Oh, please. Yeah. Like, don't tell me not to do it because then, you know, it's going to happen. Because right. I just, that's the way that I am. And, and it really crushed me. Like, really? I've won Grammys now. I've written albums. I've toured the world four times. You're telling me to be beautiful? That's what this is about? <laughs> it's my t is it all back to tits and ass? That's, that's so it, sad. That's weird to me to hear that you still get that. Yeah, I mean, yeah. well I don't now. Yeah. <laughs> um, I don't now, I'm in a good place. I have wonderful people around me. And they're all here on my team, I love you. I love you so seem much. Like, I've, I met some of them, they seem like amazing people. Okay, they're giving me two minutes, two minutes more, but, um, or I guess 119. Um, but I, I'm gonna, so I'm going to quickly ask you these uh, two things. The tour begins in May. Anything, even in a sort of general sense, you want to say about the this art rave tour and how it's going to be different conceptually to what we've seen in the past? It's going to be a great big show. Yeah. And it's going to be really fun. And we have a beautiful custom stage, and I'm going to. Um, I'm going to release the stage this week to the fans to see, right. so you can be looking out for it. Lo lots of Kuhn's presence and Abramovich presence and that kind of thing? Actually, no. No? Not no. so much. Well, you know, the, um, those collaborations and things, uh, they're part of me now, you know, and they're part of the fans. And I think what the art rave, what the art pop ball is all about is us really celebrating all the albums celebrating this new one. And I want to do, you know, not the same type of show that I get did in Austin, you know, obviously different, but that same sort of atmosphere, that, that fully passionate, creative, rebellious fun, where you can all just come and be yourselves for the night and then take it home with you. I love you. Okay, I gotta, I, it, I know this, this is selfish of me, but I want, I, I want to give her a second to say one more thing. I just want to say that it, the, the fact that you are among every artist at your level, and I'm talking about going back 30 years to some of the most, what, we, what they like to refer to as gay icons in pop music, you are the most tireless, tirelessly committed to LGBT issues of anyone I've ever known and been witness to. And A, thank you for that, and B, when you look around at the, where we're in right now, from the madness that's going on in Russia in the, on, uh, on that level to horrific places like Uganda, and by the way, you don't have to look that far, two states away to Arizona, where thankfully that was quashed, but similar initiatives are underway in about a half a dozen places. What is your, I mean, we've, we've made, a blinding progress, you know, in the last few years on so many fronts, LGBT fronts, and that, there, and there's this almost desperate pushback from people, you know, in all parts of the world. Do you have quickly, finally, any 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 thoughts on this sort of? It's not going to be easy to maintain the steps forward, but we have to band together, hands and arms and muscles, and walk forward against the hatred and the negativity and the prejudice and fight for equality and fight for love and continue to fight for it all over the world. You know, you bring up Russia and it's like, you know, we brought a lot of attention to Russia recently and now look what's happening. Yeah, yeah. And don't make a deal with the devil. <laughs> and you look at people like, someone like Pussy Riot who've gotten so much attention last year, Folks, that's a real bold mission, okay? That's yes. your real bold mission. That is the real bold mission. And 
we can all be truly bold as as a group here today and everyone who's watching and just all leave and you know in the spirit also of you know that the terrible tragedy the other night yeah let's all leave here inspired to be good to one another in every way we can through technology through music through our shows through government, through business, it's all going to come back to all of us. Because if it's killing one person, at some point it's going to kill all of us at the same time. So let's, let's, save, let's save this beautiful world that we have, and let's fight for what's right. And thank God we have her. I love you so much. Thank you I love for you asking too. me to do this. And thank you guys for being here. Thanks. I hope you're okay.